My name is Michael Goldberg, and I'm the executive director of our VL uh, Institute for Entrepreneurship at Case Western Reserve University, and I also am an associate professor at the Weatherhead School of Management. Uh, welcome to our uh, Entrepreneur Speaker Series, and it's wonderful today to partner with our friends at Cleveland State. I know um, my counterpart at Cleveland State, Colette Hart, is going to be joining in a few minutes, and we love the work that's happening at Cleveland State um, and their support of entrepreneurship. We've sent students to participate in Startup Bikes, which I hope even in our strange COVID times will still be happening this spring. And, and uh, we love the work that, that Cleveland State is doing with, with young entrepreneurs and, and are thrilled to be able to collaborate today um, to welcome uh, our friend Forrest Basin uh, to the speaker series. Um, for those of you who join our speaker series, usually oftentimes you just see one student moderator, um, but today it's you double your pleasure. You've got two student moderators. So we've got um, Tiana Anthony, who's a biomedical engineering student here at, at Case Western Reserve undergraduate, and Tim Nagy, who's an MBA student at Case Western at uh, Cleveland State University, are going to do and uh, moderate the sessions together. So I'm going to turn it over to Tiana and Tim. I'm going to ask them to do brief introductions of themselves and then they'll be in charge, so they'll be moderating the session. If you're on Zoom, put, let um, Tiana and Tim know if you have a question in the chat. We'd love to have you unmute and, and ask it directly. If you're watching on LinkedIn Live or on Facebook Live, just put a note in the comment and my colleague Doug and I will be monitoring your questions and we'll bring them in. So with that, Tiana and Tim, let me turn it over to you. And, and of course, thank you again for doing this today. Th thank you, Michael. Hi, my name is Tiana Anthony. I am a biomedical engineering student. I'm currently a junior and I'm focusing on biomaterials. So I one day hope to work for the VA on the fabrication of kidneys and livers with biocompatible polymers. Hello, my name is Tim Nagy. Um, I'm currently an MBA student at CSU. I'm also working as a client relationship manager here in Cleveland for a medical transport company. Um, so today we have Dr. Faison with us. Thank you for being here. Um, I know you have a slide prepared for us. Could you first briefly walk us through your career? Sure. Well, th thanks again, Tim. And Dr. Goldberg, thank you again for the privilege of, uh, of speaking today. And I want to thank Tiana and Tim for, uh, for moderating and being the adult supervision uh, for this. So thank you all very much. It's a real privilege and honor to be here. So I, uh, I, I joined the team at Cleveland State in March after uh, completing a 39-year career um, in the United States Navy. Uh, my background is I am uh, actually from Rocky River, so I grew up around here, and so it's great to be back. Um, and uh, throughout my career, basically, I am a, a neurodevelopmental pediatrician by training, so, so a lot of my career was spent taking care of children with developmental disabilities. Um, but ultimately, um, uh, went, went into what we call executive medicine, which are medical leadership um, roles and responsibilities, and ultimately ended up um, culminating my career as the uh, Surgeon General of the United States Navy, which is basically the CEO equivalent for uh, Navy and Marine Corps medicine. Uh, Navy and Marine Corps medicine takes care of all the, uh, the na sailors and Marine Corps uh, around the world uh, and their families and eligible others um, that seek, get their care from us. We have about 128 medical centers scattered pretty much on every continent and in every time zone, uh, staffed by about 70,000 people caring for about 2.6 million um, eligible patients, um, again, around the world. Uh, we also run a very uh, robust um, graduate education program. We have 148 programs that graduate over 1,200 physicians and over 5,000 nurses, allied health professionals, and corpsmen, which are basically EMTs on steroids um, every year, and a global research enterprise of about $3 billion um, that with research labs all over the world um, that are doing incredible work in, in dengue fever down in Peru. We just started clinical trials on a vaccine for malaria up in the jungles of Thailand. Um, malaria uh, kills more people from, as an infectious disease than any other infectious disease uh, in the world right now. Um, and so, so uh, having a vaccine for that would, uh, would dramatically improve the lives of a lot of people. Uh, and so I had the privilege of leading all that. Um, and it was $11 billion enterprise and um, uh, came back to Cleveland State to, to uh, be part of an amazing team that makes me proud every day. And uh, both to help the students that are there and to help the, my hometown. So it's great to be back. Wow, great. Thank you so much. Um, so I know you have a slide prepared for us. So I'll go ahead and share that. 
so you can do the introduction to our topics today. All right. Got it. Well, thank you again so much, Tiana, for, for doing this. And thanks to everyone for, uh, for tuning in today and for the privilege and opportunity to speak. Um, you know, as we talk about um, entrepreneurship and we talk about medicine, it is an exciting time to be involved in medicine and in healthcare. Um, perhaps more than ever before, uh, things are changing very, very rapidly. And this is what I call the tectonic plates that are shaping medicine today. And so what I thought I would do is kind of walk through each of these very briefly and then leave as much time as we can for, uh, for questions. Because um, like I say, it's an exciting time to be uh, involved in, in healthcare and in medicine, um, either from an entrepreneurial perspective, teaching uh, as a student or, or as a practitioner. It is a, a time of great change. So I'll just kind of walk you through what I see as what, uh, the tectonic plates that both create opportunity and also challenge ahead. Um, with every great challenge comes opportunity and there are opportunities in every one of these areas. The first that I'll talk about is medicine as a commodity. So for years and years and years, and really centuries, our model of healthcare has really been unchanged. Um, you, you got sick, you went to the doctor um, in some brick and mortar facility, you got cared for, and then you went back to, to your, your daily life and, and your routine. Um, if you look at that model of care, it's the same model of care that has been around since hospitals first got their start. You know, the first hospitals were actually the monasteries of Western Europe in the Middle Ages, where if you lived in the village, you went up to the monastery and the brothers took care of you. Um, same model that we've got today. You get sick, you must go somewhere to get the care. Um, and, as, and because healthcare is so heavily regulated, that market um, pretty much is dominated by, by top quality players. Pretty much because of that regulation, no matter where you go, you're gonna get pretty decent care. So what that has, has meant is that what drives decisions in healthcare today isn't necessarily quality anymore, it's convenience. And it's not cost because of third party payers. It is predominantly driven by convenience. You need healthcare, you just don't necessarily need it from a specific entity because of regulation, quality is pretty decent um, throughout the healthcare industry today. So that has given rise to things that we're seeing now like retail clinics, um, other non-medical players getting into the healthcare market. As an example, Walmart um, is in the process of putting primary care clinics in all its stores in the next two to three years. 90% of the US population lives within 15 minutes of one of their stores. Um, you're seeing the online providers get into the healthcare sphere. Amazon um, is going to dramatically change healthcare in the future. Um, so let me give you an example of this. Um, many of you might be Amazon Prime members where for $118 a year, you get free shipping. Maybe for $150 a year, Amazon will give you a, a tablet where on demand 24 seven, 365 days a year, you have access to a nurse practitioner or a PA on demand. So here's the scenario. You wake up in the morning, you've got a scratchy, scratchy throat, maybe a little bit of a runny nose. You go downstairs, you make your coffee in your fuzzy bedroom slippers, you sit at your kitchen table, you get your tablet and you punch, punch the little button and up comes the Amazon nurse practitioner with a swoosh in the background. Say, hey, how can I help you today, Mr. Faison? Well, I got a scratchy throat, a little runny nose, a little bit achy. And he just goes, well, you know, um, sounds like you've probably got the flu. Um, let me prescribe for you some Claritin, some Motrin, and maybe some Theraflu. The drone will deliver it to your house in 30 minutes. Amazon is testing drone delivery right now in 10 urban markets. Hey, um, I noticed that you have chosen to use our free electronic online health record. Thank you for doing that. Um, I noticed that your cholesterol is a little high right now. I'm prepared to offer you, if you will shop and get your groceries at Whole Food, I'm prepared to offer you 90% off fat-free products and guarantee you same-day delivery for your groceries. Um, and then, as a courtesy to you, I've made arrangements for you to get a repeat cholesterol test at the drugstore around the corner from where you live. Um, and I also noticed that you do a lot of shopping late at night, so, so you might be having difficulty with some sleep. 
So I'm prepared to offer you at a deep discount some sleep aids. Um, and I also noticed that your, your weight to, to height ratio is a little high, your body mass index is high. I'm prepared to offer you a discount on some gymnasium equipment. And we have a deal with Planet Fitness that I'll give you 30% off a membership with Planet Fitness. So think about this just for a second. From the comfort of your home, wearing your bedroom slippers, drinking your morning coffee, you just got your healthcare taken care of, um, your chronic healthcare conditions addressed, all from the convenience of your home, and you never have to travel any further than around the corner from where you live. Why would you go to see the doctor anymore? Think about that for a second. This is the direction of healthcare in the future. 70% of primary care doesn't need the expertise of a physician, and this is the direction of healthcare. But with this comes challenge, because Amazon, um, Walmart, some of the major healthcare center uh, institutions, they don't share the same electronic health record. So the risk is that as you are driven by convenience to get your care from Walmart today, Amazon tomorrow, CVS the day after that, perhaps Target the day after that, none of those electronic health records are connected. So what happens is care becomes fragmented, costs go up, outcomes go down. And so this is a challenge to look at how do we holistically approach medicine when what drives medical choice today isn't quality, is, isn't necessarily the things that we all take for granted, safety, outcomes, things like that, it's convenience. Um, and so that is a great challenge, but also an area of great opportunity. Second area is cost. We as a nation spend more on healthcare than any other nation on earth by a lot. Uh, and yet we don't have the best outcomes. Uh, in fact, uh, some of our outcomes like life expectancy and neonatal mortality are, are down around the third world um, level. So for the amount of money that we invest, we don't get um, translational outcomes that are commensurate. Furthermore, because healthcare is expensive to deliver inside a brick and mortar facility, there is a great drive to drive that into the outpatient sphere. Again, I, we've just talked a little bit about that um, as a way to control costs. And given that 70% of primary care doesn't need to see a physician as a way to integrate healthcare into people's lives instead of having it intrude on people's lives. And this has driven rise to virtual technologies uh, that you've seen and an amazing area of opportunity for entrepreneurs in the areas of sensors, artificial intelligence, um, and things like that. Big data, such as Amazon is using, will increasingly become a part of the medical landscape for the future. And that makes sense. And it won't just be medical data. It will be non-medical data. If you think about the amount of time that you spend in a physician's office relative to the total amount of your life, it is well, well south of 1% of your life. So to think that you're going to change your life patterns, behaviors, and habits to impact your, tech, your uh, outcomes based on a single physician visit or healthcare provider visit really doesn't make sense, especially when most of the chronic diseases today are what we call diseases of choice or lifestyle diseases. Um, and so the integration of big data on your habits and, and your choices that you're making um, can help improve outcomes, can help improve health for us, um, and at much, much lower cost. So this has given rise to the concept of smart cities um, and smart communities and things like that, an amazing area of opportunity um, for the future. We are challenged in healthcare um, as, a, as a career um, for the workforce. Um, you know, as you look at the future, the United States is estimated to have a 100,000 plus physician shortage within the next 10 years. As baby boomers retire, um, the younger generations are not going into healthcare like they were. We've seen the rise of competing career options in IT, cybersecurity, um, some very lucrative areas that people are not going into healthcare, predominantly because of the cost, the long training pipelines, and things like that are impediments to getting, uh, to getting people into healthcare. Furthermore, as our nation becomes more and more diverse, the healthcare profession has actually become less diverse. Cleveland is a perfect example of this. 
60% of Cleveland's population, as an example, are Black American. 7% of the physicians are. And yet there are good studies to show that if, as a Black American male, as an example, if your physician or your healthcare provider is anything other than a Black American, you are 60% less likely to follow their advice, which has significant impacts when you're trying to keep people with chronic disease healthy and certain populations are at increased risk for disease. So why is it such an impediment? One is cost, the cost to get into medicine. Um, when I was on active duty as the Surgeon General, we, uh, we did studies on this. If you go to a state medical school and just take out the average amount of student loans to go to school, just the average amount for a state school, not a high-end private, but just a state school, and you go into orthopedics, which pays pretty well, quite frankly, compared to other specialties, it takes you 17 years to pay those loans off. If you go into a primary care specialty, so pediatrics, internal medicine, family practice, or mental health, you never pay those loans off. Um, and then you've got training pipelines to go with that. Uh, we already are seeing um, shortages in other career fields, like my good friend, Tim, in nursing. Uh, you know, we're 3,500 nurses short just in Cleveland alone um, to meet the needs of the future. My son is a real good example of this. So my son is a junior at Maryland uh, right now studying cybersecurity. And when he was graduating high school, getting ready to go to college, I said, hey, son, what about medical school? Have you thought about medicine as a career? And he looks at me and he goes, dad, wh why would I incur all that debt and go through all that training when I can get right out of college after, as an undergraduate in cybersecurity and make more money than you? Can't really argue with that. So, uh, so what we're seeing is we are challenged to, find, to get people into medicine as a career. It's also harder to get in. If you come from a disadvantaged background, this is one of the things that we're working at Cleveland State, um, because of the competitiveness to get into medical school, it's very difficult if you don't have a solid STEM foundation. So how do we do that? How does the educational system and some of our inner city schools um, adapt to that and adjust to that so that our medical profession is reflective of the diverse population that we serve. So that is an area um, to look at how do we do medical education in a much more affordable, cost-effective, and oh, by the way, integrated manner. Because medicine today is practiced as a team, not as stovepiped professions. So how do we do that? That's one of the things that we're looking at at Cleveland State. And then another area, the fourth of the fifth, is the explosion in medical knowledge. Um, you know, because of collaborations and the internet and things like that, the volume of medical knowledge in the world is doubling every 73 days. We are rapidly approaching a point where it will be impossible for the human brain to know everything necessary to care for patients. And how you care for patients depends on your experience. So, so if you have not seen a condition before, it is very unlikely you will diagnose that condition. There's a lot of studies to show that. How do we expand medical experience um, and at the same time provide decision support um, and algorithms and artificial intelligence technologies to the point of care? There's a real good study by the Institute of Medicine a few years ago called To Air is Human that shows that there are 100,000 avoidable deaths in the United States solely because of variability in healthcare practice. Um, so we can no longer afford that. Um, and yet, in the midst of exploding medical knowledge, we have to find a way to drive decision support, AI, algorithms mapped to best medical practices to the point of care. And then finally, the most recent um, tectonic plate that is going to change medicine is this pandemic. Um, to put this in perspective for you uh, on how rapidly this has spread, um, I like history. So um, in the Middle Ages, in the 1300s, as you well know, um, there was an outbreak of the bubonic plague in Europe that actually came from the trading posts in Central Asia carried by traders into Europe with a port of entry being Genoa in Italy and around the 1340s or so. From, from Genoa, Italy, it took five years for the plague to reach England. Um, and of course it devastated Europe along, along the way, but five years to get from Italy to get to England. Today, because of the miracle of air travel, as we saw um, with COVID, 
you can be anywhere in the world well within the incubation period of a lethal infectious disease. Um, and that has challenged us to rapidly respond. This is exactly what we saw with COVID. As it spread out of China, it entered the United States in ports of entry, Los Angeles, New York, Seattle, and then it spread by the air routes to elsewhere. Um, and so we were challenged to, to get out of being reactive in our response to proactive because it was spreading so rapidly. The pandemic has also highlighted social disparities. Um, it has highlighted for us the difference in healthcare access, services, and outcomes among the different ethnic populations. So for example, here in Cleveland, you are 2.6 more times more likely to die of COVID if you are a black American than if you are from another, gen, uh, another ethnic group. Um, this is highlighted for us what we always knew as a nation, but have never really come to grips with dealing. Uh, and that is social disparities and health disparities in the future. And this will not be the last pandemic. So we have a window of opportunity as we, as we develop a vaccine and get this pandemic under control, we will needing, we'll need to be prepared for the next pandemic. To give you an example of this, um, the influenza. Um, everyone knows about the, hopefully the 1918 uh, influenza pandemic that in 18 months killed more people than all four years of World War I combined. When you look at the genetics of that virus, it's not all that different from the genetics of the viruses that are coming out for seasonal flu today. So we have a window of opportunity before the next pandemic. And so what I'd share with you is each of these tectonic plates are coming together to dramatically transform how medicine is, is provided today, how we plan for the future, how we care for people, and at the same time, do that in a way that is effective, efficient, um, and allows us to stay ahead of, of diseases and pandemics and not reactive. Each of these areas provides a fertile ground of opportunity for entrepreneurs, those who are innovators, those who can think into the future. Um, and so it's a great time to be in healthcare. It's a great time to be talking about this. The future is limited only by our imaginations and solving these very weighty problems. And so that's what I wanted to share with you to start and to hopefully seed the ground for some questions that you might have. So thank you very much. Thank you. So I'm going to kick off the questions, um, but for the audience, if you have any questions, go ahead and start sending them into the chat and Tim and I will start calling on them in a few minutes here. But to start off our questions, let me ask you about also you mentioned all of these tectonic plates and they're all interconnected. Um, so what do you think is a possible area that medical technology will have the largest breakthroughs and impacts in the coming futures. So maybe which of those tectonic plates are going to be maybe the main focus, um, especially in re reference to how becoming, to how there's too much knowledge maybe in the medical field for pre-meds or future physicians to keep up with. How are they going to do that? How are we going to combat that? What are some possible technologies that might prevail to help with this? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So, so I, I think there are three. Um, one is the whole area of digital medicine um, and use of big data. Um, because the data that's in your electronic health record is only a fraction of the data that's needed to keep you healthy. Because most of your diseases are either genetically based or a result of lifestyle choices. Um, and, and you do things that generate data our ability to converge those um, and to do effective, rapid data, man big data management um, will, I think, be the way of the future. As we digitize more of medicine, uh, I, I think the whole field of IT and health-related IT and data management, data science, those types of things are going to help drive healthcare. The second is going to be genetics. You know, one of the transformative um, forces that's going on right now is um, 23andMe or Ancestry.com, as an example, as we bring affordable genetic um, analysis to the masses, that is creating a rich repository of genetic data that we can then study to identify the genetic linkages between diseases, behaviors, and other things that impact our health um, and ultimately our outcomes. Um, and I think as we do more of those studies and then tie that into 
big data management and use that to help inform how we take care of patients. The whole field of precision medicine, I think is gonna be a major driver in the future. And, and the third area is the growth of artificial, artificial intelligence and sensors um, that will allow us from the artificial intelligence perspective to drive um, well-informed um, decision support and algorithms to the point of care to the provider in the exam room. You know, as a physician, when I go see a patient, I got 20 minutes with that patient. You know, if, if, if I don't have decision support rapidly at my fingertips, then I can't use that to ensure that what I'm doing for that patient is maps, maps to best practices and best available information at the time. Decision support is going to be critical for this. And then that has got to be informed by all the stuff I just talked about, plus sensors. Um, you know, there are so many sensors today in your Apple Watch and all these different things, using those data streams to both help inform diagnoses and treatment plans, but then to monitor the effectiveness of those treatment plans, uh, and then use that to inform to the point of care, uh, the decisions of your providers, I think is going to be critical. Those three areas I see are the big areas for the future. All right. So we do have some questions coming in here. Um, Anna Frovlova, if you'd like to unmute and ask uh, your question. Yes, sure, Mr. Faison. So, um, you know, with what you just talked about, all of the changes uh, and, and that you see in tectonic plates, so to speak, what would you give us an advice to younger generation who is looking at what, what they should become, what kind of professions, what kind of areas uh, they should be focusing on? Uh, thanks, Anna. Thanks for that question. Here's what I tell everyone, because um, I, I do a lot of mentoring for, for young folks, and this is the most important thing that I tell them. Take some time to, to answer these questions for your life. What do you want to do with your life? And at the end of your life, what do you want to say that you've accomplished? That really ought to drive your decisions. You, you ought to go into something that you can get excited to be a part of every single day. Um, and you ought to be able to answer for yourself, what do you want to do with your life? That'll be more important as you get older, because as you get older uh, and get more experience and things like that, you have more and more career opportunities. You know, there are on ramps and off ramps to your career that will be presented to you as you go through life. How do you decide which are good and which are not so good? Uh, if you don't have, ha have taken time to answer for yourself, what's the purpose of your life and what do you want to accomplish with your life? It becomes impossible to decide, to decide what to do with your life. So perhaps the most important advice I can give you is to take some time out for yourself, do a little bit of self-reflection and say, what do I want to do with my life? For me, you know, I was taught growing up that life was about helping people and helping others. Um, and, and I actually didn't plan to go into medicine. When I was growing up in Rocky River, you know, I, I went to college with the intention to become a minister um, because I thought well, that would be a pretty cool way to help people. You know, you get to wear some cool clothes once a week. Uh, a lot of free food, not too strenuous, and you really only need to know one book. So I'm in. Um, and, um, you know, when I was a freshman at college, um, my dad w w lost his job. That's when the steel industry um, had some challenges here in Cleveland. And, and he moved down to um, D.C. and got another job, and I couldn't afford to go to college. So I put myself through college by working in this brand new medical school that the military was building um, there in Bethesda as a lab assistant, cleaning test tube and take care of lab rats. Um, and I learned about medicine and decided to become a doctor um, because I thought it would be a pretty cool way to help people. So, so and then it kind of went from there. Um, so, so take the time to think about what it is you want to do with your life. What's the purpose of your life and what do you want to accomplish? And then let that be your guide for what you do with your life. Does that help? Yes, thank you so much. It's very inspiring. Thank to, you. What you just said, uh, it helps. Uh, so maybe my question is, is a little bit different, uh, and it is more about opportunities that you see going forward uh, in what kind of fields. You know, and just understand that young people need to uh, search, you know, their own souls to, to get yeah. there. But you know, at the end of the day, you still need to acquire specific skills early on to get maybe somewhere where you want it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a great question. I, I will tell you, any, any career in healthcare is both rewarding and needed and has a bright future. Whether it's being a physician um, going forward, especially in areas that are going to be needed in the future, like geriatrics as the, as the baby boomer population like me 
gets older. We need people to take care of us. Um, nursing, there are huge opportunities in nursing, allied health professions, all good. Medical research is exploding right now. Um, and we need sharp, smart minds in medical research, w whether that's in biomedical engineering um, or whether that's at, in bench research. You know, virology is a huge area right now. A variety of different research areas are, are amazingly needed. Um, data science and IT related fields, because that's the future of medicine. Um, so it just depends on what interests you and where do you feel like you can make the most difference. And most importantly, what can you get excited to get out of bed to do every day? That to me is, is critical. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for that great question. So I believe Nicholas Baronet um, has a question. If you're okay with unmuting and asking, that'd be great. Sure. Hi, Dr. Faison, this is Nick Barron from Case. I work closely with uh, Nigamon Sridhar and Shilpa Kadar and Ben Ward and the group there in the IoT Collaborative. Yeah. Nice to put, nice to put a face to you. <laughs> you too, Nick. Um, so question, as a, you know, telemedicine has been forced into the fore with, you know, the pandemic. As a physician, where do you think the biggest gaps are right now in providing the kind of telemedicine care that you would like to give your patients, either military families or, you know, civilians? Where are those gaps? Yeah, that's a great question, Nick. So I, I was actually privileged to to run telemedicine for the Department of Defense um, as, as part of my career. Um, I, you know, I think the technology is there. Um, I, I think that's, that's not the issue. I think the two issues, one of which is, is actually being resolved by this pandemic, which is acceptance both by the, by the providers and by the patients. Um, as more and more healthcare is now delivered virtually just out of necessity, that, that really has addressed the, uh, the issue of acceptance, which leads to the remaining challenges. You know, medicine is, is basically a series of guilds. It's state controlled. Every state is basically its own guild. And so we don't have transportability of licensure across state lines. So that if, if you're a patient here in Ohio and the world's expert for your condition is in California, you ought to be able to get on telemedicine and be able to take advantage of that. I mean, we live in the richest nation in the, in the world. We ought to be able to take advantage of that. But licensure restriction by the guilds has challenged us in that regard. Our nation is going to have to deal with that because what we are seeing is both a shortage of healthcare providers and a maldistribution of healthcare providers. To, to get to Ron's specialty as an example, mental health lends itself incredibly well to telemedicine. But did you know that in the United States, there are well over 3,000 counties without any flavor of mental health provider whatsoever? Um, there is great need that telemedicine can help us address um, if we can get over the guild mentality and open up licensure and transportability across state lines. That, to me, is the greatest challenge we've got right now. Interesting. Thank you. Thanks. That was another great question there. Um, so we do have another one. Heidi, if you'd like to unmute and ask your question. Sure, Dr. Faison, um, if a young ent entrepreneur has an idea for a medical product or service of some type, are there support organizations or resources available to guide them? Yeah, that's a great question. That, that's actually something Dr. Goldberg and I are trying to work on to put together something for, for Cleveland. Because you're right, if, you're, if you've got a good idea, who do you call? Um, you know, there, Cleveland, Cleveland, as an example, has got three world-class healthcare institutions right here in, in the city and, and more healthcare providers per thousand population than any other city in the United States with the exception of Pittsburgh. But who do you call? Who do you call for that? So um, right now, it's a kind of who do you know uh, and who might be interested in, in, in investing with you. What, what Dr. Goldberg and I are trying to put together with some of our colleagues from Cleveland Clinic, Metro, and UH is kind of a collaborative um, to focus on health, to focus on some of the areas of need in the future. But, but perhaps one of the more important things that this would do is kind of answer that question. Who do you call if you got a good idea? Because um, we don't have a good uniform approach to that right now. We're hopeful to have one 
for Cleveland through this partnership that we're trying to build um, that would then create a model for, for other cities or other areas to be able to do the same. Perfect, thank you. Um, so a question for myself here. When it comes to the COVID-19 crisis, what do you see as the biggest challenges that higher education faces and what are some possible solutions to these? Yeah, thank, thanks, Tim. That is a great question. You know, I, I think there's a few. You, you know, remember I talked about models of care and the healthcare model kind of is, kind of gets its roots from the Middle Ages um, in the monasteries of Europe. The higher education model gets the same roots from the Middle Ages. I mean, if you look at how higher education has been done with the campus community, a very insular community focused on academics, all the good things that we want to see um, in, in higher education to create that environment of, of critical questioning and, and uh, things like that, um, that model was significantly challenged um, in the pandemic and, and has given rise to alternate models of content delivery. Um, and, and education remotely and things like that. Um, we need to build on those because the other thing that we found is that model of traditional academia is fragile. Uh, I, I think you're seeing the impact of this from financial shortfalls, um, from uh, there are colleges that are not just not going to survive this. Um, so I think the future looks at how do we do higher education in the future what are the different ways that we might do it to build resilience into our higher education efforts? Um, and then how do we reach people to be able to do this, to make it affordable, to make it accessible, to integrate education into their lives instead of having it intrude on their lives? We, we, we work this all the time at Cleveland State. You know, many of our students, we focus on an, a, um, an urban population. Many of our students hold down second and third jobs to be able to go to college. Um, they deserve to have the same opportunities that everybody else has got. So how do we adapt those models of education to be able to meet their needs and make it easier for them to be able to get their degrees and then go on and get those jobs that, that are so important for their future? So, so I, think, I think the models of educational delivery um, are going to have to change for the future to, to introduce resilience and robustness to higher education. I think there'll need to be an analysis of the vulnerabilities of higher education, both in terms of our financing models, um, as, as well as other um, critical vulnerabilities that we're finding as we march through this together. Um, and then the other thing that we're gonna have to deal with is fear. Um, you know, this pandemic has created great fear um, amongst people. And, and our efforts have got to be successful in convincing people as we get through this, that it is safe to come back. It is a good place to come back. And, and our, our ability to do that effectively, I think is gonna directly translate to the success or not of the future of higher education. So those are kind of just some initial thoughts that I had. Yeah, great, thank you so much. Um, that's quite um, an encompassing and real problem that like is really hitting a lot of students currently. So quite an eye-opening time. Um, so if anyone has any more questions, just keep putting them in the chat. You can raise your hand. We'll call on you. But for the time being, I will go ahead and ask maybe more about the history of your time as a Surgeon General. So when you started your career, did you, you kind of mentioned and touched on you weren't even planning on being in the medical profession at all. Um, so how did you kind of find your way? What feelings did you have? How was it scary? Maybe just describe your career emotionally, I guess. Sure. No, no, thanks. Thanks for that. You know, like I say, as I shared, I didn't plan to become a physician. And, and then kind of, you know, one thing led to another. I think, I think the unifying um, message that I would tell you, the, the lesson I've learned is twofold. Number one is sometimes God plans your life differently than you do. Um, and number two is where you think you're going to end up is probably not where you're going to end up. And, and my, my case is exactly that. When I was a high school student at Rocky River High School, um, I did not think I was going to be in the Navy. Um, I did not think I was certainly not going to spend 39 years as the Navy or become the Surgeon General. Um, but, you know, one thing led to another. So, you know, to pick up where I left off, decided to become a, a um, 
physician. I couldn't afford to go to medical school. I didn't know about the scholarship program. So I applied to that military medical school and got in. Um, and when you get into the military medical school, they send you a letter. It says, hey, congratulations, you got into medical school. What, uh, what service do you want to be in? So, so I took that letter to my friends. I go, you know, because I didn't have a military background. I go, what do you guys think? And somebody goes, well, I go, what about the army? And somebody goes, do you like to camp? I go, I hate camping. There's a reason God made room service. Um, you know, so you well, don't be in the army. Oh, what about the Air Force? They have stuff in North Dakota. It's cold. Forget it. Public health service, you're working in prisons. Navy, you're probably always near a beach. So I chose the Navy. Um, and then I became a pediatrician because I just, I like taking care of children. Um, you know, it's, it's a very vulnerable population. And then I went and did a fellowship in neurodevelopmental pediatrics, which is care of children with developmental disabilities. Because <clears throat> I found that very rewarding. I mean, you don't really cure autism or cerebral palsy or mental retardation. But what you do is you help families move through their grieving process um, and, and adjust to a future that's different than the one that they envisioned uh, and help them work through that. And I found that to be very, very professionally satisfying. And the, the, the military, because we send people all over the world, runs schools all over the world. Um, and so I was in charge of taking care of children with developmental disabilities and their education programs um, uh, at these schools all over the world. And I was sent out, you know, uh, based out of a hospital, and I, and I found out that the commanding officer of that hospital wanted me to be the, be the medical director, which I didn't want to do because those, those guys push paper and I didn't want to do that. I was happy taking care of patients. So, so I avoided this guy for five days. Wherever he was, I went somewhere else. So he couldn't ask me. And, and then I ran into him and he goes, I'd like you to be the medical director. Yes, sir. I'm happy to do that. And he looked at me and he goes, this is going to change your life forever. And, and I didn't believe him at the time. But he was right, because as I got into this, uh, you know, again, I had that conversation with myself, what's the purpose of your life? And again, for me, it's to help people. I, I found that going into to these different positions that really didn't have a, a white lab coat or a bedside or a stethoscope really allowed me to help people on a much broader scale than I could ever have done one-on-one. -on -one. So, so, so I was privileged to be in charge of the medical response to the earthquake that happened in Haiti. Um, where, where we were providing all the medical support for that. Um, that earthquake flattened every hospital in that country. They had nothing. Um, and so we have hospital ships. I was in charge of getting the hospital ship down there and setting up um, field hospitals across that country. Um, I, I was privileged to be in charge of the medical response for the uh, Fukushima nuclear disaster in Japan. And we evacuated 9,000 um, Americans out of Japan in 72 hours and brought them back to the United States and I was in charge of all that. So I got to help a lot of people in a lot of different ways. This current, current pandemic that I'm um, helping CSU and state public um, universities with, this is my sixth pandemic. Um, so, so I've been privileged to be part of the planning for the Ebola um, outbreak that occurred in Western Africa. The Navy provided all the diagnostic testing throughout Western Africa um, for that. We uh, developed the, the testing that occurred for Zika and all the response for that. So, so I just found that, you know, as I, as I progressed, um, I had an opportunity to care for people on a much broader scale and grander scale um, to help a lot of people than I could have done one-on-one -on -one, uh, with individual patients. Was, was it unnerving? Absolutely. Um, was, was it nervous? Yes. As you get more senior, um, things become more complex. You know, I, I tell people everything that was all black and white and pretty easy to decide, somebody else decide, decided already. And everything that was all good for all people at all times under all circumstances has already been solved. So everything that you deal with as you get more senior as a leader is complex. Um, and you need to be comfortable with that. And, and that, was, that took some getting used to. So, so you have to be comfortable with complexity. You have to be uh, comfortable with um, conflict and dealing with different perspectives um, and being able to build coalitions and teams. Um, you've gotta be comfortable with all those things that they really don't teach in medical school. But, but if you can do those things, can open up opportunities to help people on, on a scale that you could never have otherwise done. So it's been a great journey. So I think we have time for one more question here. Um, Paul, I see you asked a question. Would you like to unmute and uh... Ask Dr. Fasan. 
Sure. Uh, thanks so much for uh, the talk today and uh, <clears throat> appreciate the dialogue. I'm uh, just really interested. You, you mentioned uh, the response in the higher education and what may have long-term effect versus, you know, uh, what pivots, you know, may need to be made. What, what about in the military? Where do you see things that, you know, uh, may either challenges that have been faced that were unanticipated or things that, um, you know, you see as opportunities in the future for the military as a result of what we've seen and learned during this pandemic? Yeah, that's a great question, Paul. Thank you. So, so the military exists to protect us and defend our freedoms. Um, and, and what you're seeing globally on the global stage is what we call a return to great power competition. So, so you know, after the fall of the Soviet Union and the Berlin Wall in 1989, we really didn't have a peer competitor on the global stage for, for several decades. Now we are starting to see the rise of peer competitors. So you're seeing uh, the rise of China. You're seeing a resurgent Russia. You're seeing other regional um, players, state actors, where, where before, from 1989 until, until really the Gulf War, it was non-state actors, terrorist groups, and things like that. Um, and so that has changed the dynamic of the role of the military on the global stage. Uh, in parallel, we've moved to a global economy. Um, so, so no longer is our economic well-being just dependent on what goes on within the borders of the United States. I mean, I think the pandemic has highlighted that um, perhaps more than any other event that we've seen. So, so, so the need to preserve world peace, harmony, preservation of trading routes, um, you, you know, most of, speaking for the Navy, most of the things that we use in our lives, day-to-day -day lives, come to us by sea. 98% of the goods and services that we use in our daily lives come by sea from overseas. Every day there are 27,000 ships at sea bringing goods and services to the United States. The, the role of the military is to protect the security and sovereignty of those shipping lanes, preserve commerce, and at the same time provide um, deterrence and response if needed to rising global powers. What does that mean? That means that force has got to be ready, that our nation expects that force to be able to defend us tonight. If you're going to fight tonight, you got to be ready tonight. Uh, and so we have learned a great deal um, from this pandemic that I think will be applicable to the future. The first is how to preserve the health of the force, because um, that force is the same age as all these people that you see on TV partying downtown. Um, that's the same. How do you educate them and, take, and get them to take ownership in an effective way of their health and do things that are smart and doesn't, don't put other people at risk? The other is conquer fear. You all remember the incident with the Teddy Roosevelt, the aircraft carrier, where the, where the CO you know, basically sent a letters out and got published. That guy was operating off fear. Um, and you have to be able to, con to, to uh, address that because if you don't do that, you just told your adversaries or potential adversaries, that the, the commanding officer, the guy in charge of that nuclear aircraft carrier is afraid. That is not a good message to send your adversaries. And, and so we've learned a great deal about how do we prepare people for um, the privilege of command and how do we keep that force healthy to be able to defend us, preserve those things that are necessary for our, for our uh, way of life and security in the future. So we've learned a ton from this. Alrighty, so I think we're about out of time for all of the questions. I would like to thank the audience so much for these great questions. Mm -hmm. Of course, thank yeah, you. Thank you. Bazin for your time and your insightful answers. So I'm going to go ahead and throw it to Mr. Goldberg. Great. And Tiana and Tim, thanks so much for moderating. It's, it's always fun uh, to see you guys acquire new skills in addition to all your learning at our respective universities. So you did a great job. Um, Forrest, thank you for doing this. I was, and I, I do want to actually uh, turn the floor over to Colette in a second, but I was, I was private, private messaging her and just remarking um, how lucky we are in this phase of your career for you to come back to Cleveland. I mean, you're already in this very strange time that you came back to our city where we're meeting each other, so many of us via Zoom and remotely. You've made a huge impact and uh, it's been a pleasure to work with you, as you said, we're, uh, our universities are working together and looking for ways to, to build and do more together. So we're thrilled to have you. And in the post-pandemic time, even do more in person together. So, of course, thank you for 
joining us today and for everything you're doing in our community. Oh, thank you, Michael. It's a real privilege to be back home and to work with, with all of you. I'll tell you, uh, it's just a real privilege and honor to be back. Thank you. Right. Right. Colette, let me, um, I know Colette are joined a few minutes late, but um, it's great to partner with you. This is really one of the first sessions we've done in partnership um, with another university and Cleveland State has been a partner with us um, in a number of the work that we've done, whether it's sending students to start up bikes. So I don't know if Colette, if you wanted to quickly say hi and talk about some of the work that you guys are doing at Cleveland State with uh, entrepreneurs on campus and in the community. Sure. So first, thank you, Michael, for including CSU. Um, and uh, um, obviously we're honored to share um, uh, Dr. Fajan as well as Tim Nagy, our MBA student, um, in this, this dialogue um, across universities and, and the community as a whole. So th these kinds of discussions are what we need right now. Um, and you know, kudos to you for um, pulling together um, the Veal Institute uh, speaker series, entrepreneurial speaker series. It's, it's really been provocative and it's included um, a lot of different topics that uh, I, I think are needed, especially right now during the, the pandemic. So thank you. We're, we're just really excited. Um, I oversee the Western Ideation Lab at uh, Cleveland State University. And um, we partner across 10 universities in Northeast Ohio, as, as well as we serve students university-wide at CSU. Um, and our partnership with CASE um, is, is, is pretty um, comprehensive in that we are able to partner with um, LaunchNet, the Veal Institute, and we actually have exchange of students on an ongoing basis. And, and Michael and I have had numerous opportunities to, to look at global entrepreneurship and other topics um, as well and make sure that we're engaging our students in these unique opportunities to work together. So this is just another example of, of that collaboration. And um, we thank you for the opportunity. And um, thank you, Tiana and Tim and um, Dr. Fajan for a great conversation today. Thank great. you, Colette.